Very there nice. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. To lead off the show, our leadoff hitter, Mr. Joseph, Joey Totz for ready. Rob, I'm glad you mentioned this shooting in Georgia happened about a, an hour from my home and caused quite a stir down here. And, and uh, we're, we're debating it uh, uh, as we kind of contemplate what happened there. It brought to mind a, a 20-year-old young man who uh, was, uh, I guess, for the most part, considered a shut-in, was addicted to the video game Call of Duty, and um, uh, was kind of asocial, short-tempered, short te- uh, attention span. And investigations later found that uh, he kept news clippings and a spreadsheet tacked to his wall in his bedroom about mass shootings. In his house, there was over a half a dozen rifles and handguns, hundreds of rounds of ammunition and high-capacity magazines. There were also assorted knives, a samurai sword, and a bayonet. Bullets were found in this home, stored in plastic baggies throughout the house, and in a planter's nut canister on the kitchen counter. We know that young man was Adam Lanza, who marched out of that home and into an elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut, to slaughter over 20 primary age students and their teachers. And his mother, who was searching the Internet for child psychology articles related to her son, of course, paid with her life. One might ask, was that mother who lived with this fatherless young man aware of what was going on? Was she oblivious to the evidence of a strange behavior? Were the guns in the home kept in a safe? Was the ammunition stored in a secure place? Who was responsible for making sure that those destructive weapons that were found in the investigation after the shooting were safely stored? You know, we can contemplate the rising death toll of students killed in their classroom with this latest shooting in Georgia. But I think we have to begin to ask, what are we prepared to do now? Thoughts and prayers don't seem to be working because we've had over 400 school shootings since Columbine. Think about that. And that's a small amount compared to all the mass shootings in the country. I think, and I'm proposing this morning, the parents should be held accountable. You mentioned that father, Colin Gray, who... uh, found it appropriate to gift his son to wrap it up at Christmas time, an AR-15, six months after the FBI and the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, visited that home about the son's postings online about shooting up a school. Think about whether red flag laws would have given Adam Lanza's mother another option instead of searching child psychology articles on the Internet. Think about... Uh, if you do, uh, that we have a mental health crisis in this country and whether there's a commitment to pay for all the child psychologists we're going to need to deal with this, these troubled youth and also the hundreds of thousands of students who have been traumatized by school shootings. Because uh, I think the Washington Post estimated 380,000 students now have been exposed to a shooting in their school. If you think arming teachers and resource officers is the answer, understand that schools like Parkland and the school in Georgia just up the road here had them in place, and yet there was still a body count to deal with. I recognize the sanctity of home, guys, and I understand that government intrusion is something that we really don't tolerate, especially when it comes to our homes. But with many societal ills that we're dealing with today, the problems originate in the home, and I think we've got to be prepared to do something about it. And I understand we've got a Second Amendment, but and there's over 450 million guns in this country. That's a reality we're going to have to deal with. But I'm ready to have laws in place that require the safe storage of these guns in the home, to keep them out of hands of troubled 14-year-olds, and that hold parents responsible if they feel it's appropriate to hand such a gun to their child who is clearly exhibiting problems. Half the states in this country have gun safe storage laws. West Virginia is not one of them. I think it's time our legislature gets down to business. And I'm interested in what others have to think. I just happen to have a legislator in the room right now, Delegate Michael Height. Let's begin with you. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm shocked by this again. I don't understand why a child who was investigated a year before um, still had access to to weapons why they weren't being locked up to begin with a lot of this goes back to parenting you know what who what was this guy thinking 
Why weren't his his uh, weapons locked up? Why was he gifting a a child with obvious uh, mental issues uh, an AR-15 at, at 14 at that? Um, and you can go back and say the same thing about the the, the woman um, who paid with her life. You know, why why weren't her weapons locked up? I you know I. A lot of this goes back to parenting. You have to recognize where your kids are. I can remember a time when I went to school, there were there were guns in the parking lot at school, in the back of pickups. There were, you know, and this was not an issue. So what has changed between, you know, the, the 70s and 80s and, and today? You know, what is the mentality? What is the, the parenting? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it can't be to come in and confiscate all the guns. There's just too many of them out there. We have the Second Amendment. Um, we have the Fourth Amendment um, that protects you know you from uh, seizure of of your uh, your weapons with without uh, a proper search warrant or without proper cause. Um, so I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, I'm oblivious. I don't know anymore. Mr. Carl. Well, <clears throat> I don't think there's, you know, it's, it's, it's that difficult to figure out. Uh, the Second Amendment is, is there, but it doesn't preclude all reasonable governmental steps to stop violence. And, and uh, there's, there, you know, and the evidence that, you know, the, the, these facts we've heard, just heard about, it was a overwhelming evidence that these people were a threat, and, and there should be clear authority and, and uh, mandate to respond to that, you know, by uh, public safety, by the schools, you know, by, by everybody that has, you know, shares responsibility for public safety. So, so uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, the Second Amendment is you know, is, 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 uh, threatened, uh, but it is not absolute. And, and, and public safety is a greater mandate than anything else in the constitution. And in this particular case, Joe, as you mentioned in your introduction there, the, uh, family was investigated by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and the federal Bureau of Investigation in regards to threats had, had it already been made, correct? Yeah, that he, he had made uh, threats about shooting up a school and had a visit to the home where the parent, the father, assured the authorities that he did not have access to guns. And six months later, he's gifted an AR-15. Well, the, the, and the penalty for, the, for you know, that father should be overwhelming. <laughs> I mean, it, and in fact, it might should be execution but at least it ought to be absolute prison and huge liability he, he so, was arrested yeah. this morning as i understand it yeah and you know it's not a simple solution there there very little in life is you want to know why things are getting worse it's this kids kids used to get bullied but the bullying would stop at the end of the day they go home and they don't deal with it this is 24-7. And you're, for our radio audience's benefit, you're holding up your smartphone. Yes. The, the sm smartphones, 24-7 access to social media, 24-7 access from your bullies to you. Um, we don't deal with bullies well in school. We don't, comp we don't have a comprehensive plan to deal with bullies in school. We don't have mental health resources. We have a sh shortage of mental health resources in this country, not just for teens and kids, but for adults as well. There's a crisis in mental health right now. Um, so we're not getting the help that needs to go to children. We're not getting the, the help uh, to deal with bullying. We don't, get, we don't have resources dealing with what social media is doing to kids. Um, we, we've got to start really having a rational conversation not political we're not we we can't we can't just go into this trying to score political points anymore this is not about you know red state versus blue state and we get this and we get that we got to have a r rational conversation we need to have a talk about gun culture we've got a lot of people who who for 
all intents and purposes, their guns are their <laughs> entire personality. And you've got to kind of rein that in. Like, guns are a defense mechanism. They are a tool. They are not you. You can't be your gun. Um, you know, that... I think people have just so invested the idea of gun culture into the United States that, yes, we are we we do want to protect it because of the Second Amendment, because of our experience when when you know when we were going through the the Revolutionary War where gun confiscation gun, gun confiscation happened, we do believe in the right to protect ourselves, to be free from government interference on that. But we also have to have responsibility, and I think that's another thing that we've absolutely abdicated is. I don't want responsibility for my actions. And you've got to have responsibility for your actions. If you are leaving your guns out for your kids to pick up and go take to school, yes, absolutely there should be actions or should be responsibilities for that. There should be consequences for that. Um, I don't have a problem with the Michigan fa fa uh, husband and wife that got put in jail over their son's use of weapons in the school. Uh, I will not have problems with this guy going to jail for... Uh, his son shooting up a school. Yes, there was a school resource officer, and and thankfully there was a school resource officer in that one because he did give up relatively quickly. I mean, uh, not quick enough for the people who were shot, but um, at least that one confronted him. Parkland was a complete Parkland and uh, Uvalde, Texas. Those were complete failures of law enforcement from top to bottom, but. There are solutions out there. We've got to talk to one another, and we've got to understand that we are. Th this is a comprehensive solution that needs to come to the fore, and we need to stop scoring political points and need to stop spiking the political football in each other's faces when things like this happen. Chris Chernick made a comment before we get to Brad. David, that I'd like you to address as well because we have seen that these incidents do happen in other countries, but nowhere near with the prevalence that they happen in America. And Chris writes, what is the difference in other countries then? They have social media, same mm -hmm. video games. Why is it a uniquely American problem? And, it, and again, it, it does happen in other countries, but nowhere near with the rapidity that happens here. I, th I think it's the, the gun culture. Um, and I do think that's part of it. But I also think that um, other countries have much better mental re health resources and much better access to mental health resources so that, you know, if you are getting bullying, uh, bullied, you are, there are consequences to that, to those actions. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know so much about their educational system, whether they deal with bullying better than we do. I would hope so. And maybe there's something that we can learn from those countries as far as how they deal with bullying, how they deal with uh, the mental health of their, their children. Are there early, you know, is there early screening for children with for, for mental illness to see if they, there's something that can be done? Rather than just pushing pills down their throat, we, we know that there's kind of been an endemic of, of them throwing pills down the throat of children uh, rather than dealing with some of their, their, you know, outbursts in the classroom. But actual mental health screening so that you know we can get them the actual treatment that they need for the conditions that they may have um and and maybe exacerbated by things like bullying and soci societal pressures in the school bradley no come a little closer to you mike brett this is obviously a, a a sad situation and will there be more yeah there will probably be more um it's my understanding that at that facility and at that school they had tags on the teachers that could press a button and law enforcement would immediately be there and they probably reacted as quick as they possibly could but uh, I, I view this as an isolated incident and um, it, it's very sad but can we do more I I'm I don't have an answer to this. Uh, I, I'm a pro-gun, I'm a gun advocate. I was born and, and used weapons my entire life. And, and to me, this is an example of bad parenting. How many times do we see 
bad parenting. And sometimes, you know, and, and I've seen it. I've seen it within this week. I saw a parent have a small child on the lawnmower with them. Now, to me, that's bad parenting. Do we ever say anything? Did I say anything about it? No, I did not. And I, and I, I regret it. How many times do we beat other people and, and we make the mistakes of saying, well, that's none of my business. That's the other parent. Let the parent be the parent. But um, this is bad parenting, and they should throw the book at this guy. Let this be a lesson to other parents that behave the same way. Joe, comes back to you. Yeah, I'm going to echo uh, what Brad just said and uh, also what Mike Carl was alluding to. You know, the, a government role here is for the security of its citizens. And, uh, heck, we have a president who takes an oath to protect the, the citizens uh, against enemies, both foreign and domestic. And there has to be a, a realization here that some of the domestic enemies we're dealing with are bad parents. Uh, and look, if, if, if CPS, the Child Protective Services, on a credible report can come to your home, enter your home, and find that your, your children are in peril, and as a remedy, take your kids away from you, that's government intrusion resulting in you losing custody of your children. Should we not have a law in place that allows uh, uh, for a duty to be imposed on gun owners, that they have a duty in that home to protect their children from those guns. Because don't, don't forget, we're also dealing with many accidental shootings that take place because of kids handling these weapons. Uh, the, the, the benefit of all this would be protecting these kids from these guns and the inherent danger associated with the guns and also protecting the public from these children who have you know, bad intentions and are certainly troubled going out and shooting up other people. Uh, I think we have to put the tools in place for the government to enforce some measures of safety here. And I applaud those states that have passed gun safe storage laws. It gives prosecutors, it gives the court system the tools to impose duties on folks so that we can hold them accountable. Everybody's going to own guns. I own guns. I'm like Brad No, I grew up with guns, had guns in my family and in my household uh, since I was born. Uh, but we had rules regarding those guns. And unfortunately, some parents fail in that respect, and they need to be held accountable. This man in Georgia will be charged like those parents in, in Michigan. And I think we have to prepare ourselves for other parents being charged. There has to be accountability on this. Uh, it took a long time, Rob, for us to adopt the use of seatbelts. And I remember, like you do, when those laws first came out, you know, it was an infringement on freedom, and I'm not wearing my seatbelt if I don't want to. Well, now it's a law, and you can be fined for it if you're not wearing it. Uh, and, and if you drive around, you see really good compliance with that law. It took a long time, and I, I suspect it's going to do uh, with guns, too. It's going to take a while, but we have to do something to stem the tide of, of, of this this violence uh, because it's affecting uh, we're losing lives of course but it's also affecting uh, how these schools operate and, and what these these students have to deal with on a daily basis a few of us joe are old enough to remember being in cars that didn't even have seat belts <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's true <laughs> then you had that lap belt which would just sever you in half so that you didn't suffer during the accident you just got the, <laughs> Decapitated, basically, from the waist up. Uh, Joe, again, good uh, good stuff to lead us off. Thank you kindly, sir. We are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin. He and the crew will be busy tonight covering high school football in the area. We are uh, sponsored in part by the Mansion Ready Law Offices in Martinsburg. Joseph, take it from here. Rob, we are located at 201 East John Street in downtown Martinsburg and are there answering questions regarding personal injury, insurance claims, and the like. You can call us at 264-8505 or visit us on the web at wvjusticelawyers.com. Well done, Joseph. Also brought to you in part by CMA Honda. And we move on to, uh, first and foremost, uh, let me take a moment to thank uh, Delegate Michael Hornby, mogul owner of said establishment who filled in this week as a co-host and as a main host also on uh, on Tuesday when I was coveting it. Uh, by the way, uh, negative tests now. 
I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I'm okay to be around. You don't have to run when you see me. I'm not typhoid Mary any longer. <laughs> I'm breathing right at Valente right now, too, as hard as I can. <laughs> and also Bill Kearns uh, from the health department. Bill uh, stepped up a couple of mornings uh, this week as well. Maria Lawrence was in her usual seat on Wednesday, uh, too. So uh, thanks to everybody who helps keep this show moving along, whether I'm here uh, or not. And as we move on to issue number two, we go into the Bill Stubblefield seat. Bill's back next week. Right now, it's Mr. David Valente. Hey, so um, by all measures, well, rational measures, I know that there are a few outliers there, but uh, national polling is going against the, the Donald Trump campaign, and, and um, he, it, you know, we are a very d- divided electorate, but it looks like he is losing the election at this point. Uh, this next week, we are going into the first president, first and probably only presidential debate of this uh, cycle uh, between Harris and Trump. Of course, we know that there was one in June that led to the downfall of Joe Biden. But at this point, is this debate an absolute must win for Trump? If Trump does not solidly defeat Harris in this debate, is this this election a fait accompli? That is the question. And I want to start first on the phone with Joe Ferretti. Go. Interesting question, David. I, I'm not sure how you win a debate these days uh, by what measures we we uh, apply to determine who prevailed and who didn't. I, you know, it's all, I guess, in the eyes of the beholder sometimes. And, and oftentimes I get the sense that the debate performances are really geared towards the candidates speaking to their base rather than trying to convince uh, those few in the middle who are persuadable at this point. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, how you uh, figure out who won or who lost the debate. I do know they go in with certain goals in mind, and I suspect that uh, Harris's goals are to uh, appear to be on top of some policy issues, to not look so far left, which uh, she's been attempting to do, much to Mike Carl's chagrin. Uh, and I think that, that Trump's goal has to just, you know, not be a jackass uh, and, and and ask. Uh, uh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I, I mean, look, his problem is, and I, I'm convinced that we have these debates all the time amongst the people I hang out with. I think Nikki Haley would be five to seven points up if she was a nominee. He's just such a polarizing figure, and so so many people have such antipathy for him. I think he has to just behave, uh, and that's what the whole thing about you know the open mic yeah. situation is about. It, it it really instills a discipline on him not to, to act like an idiot. So if he goes in there and and uh, is cordial and not so absurdic and not so uh, insulting, uh, I think he can do well. So I, I just think it's what goals they have in mind here and whether they meet them and uh, as to whether or not they win or lose. I, you know, we'll leave that to the people on Fox and CNN to figure out. But I just think they have to meet their goals. And I think if, if one of them meets their goals best, uh, it'll serve them well going forward. Mr. Height. Well, I, I think the interesting thing is well, when it comes to to elections right now on a national level, I think it's about getting at your base. And I think uh, Trump was up early on because I think the the people on the left weren't happy with their nominee and um, not necessarily going to show up to the polls uh, because of that. And I think that's why the, the the people in high places on the left pushed Joe Biden to get out of the race because they were worried about the down ballot. Um, and now that Harris is uh, the nominee, um, I think there's some renewed hope on the left that, hey, maybe we can win this. Not necessarily that, that Harris is, is the greatest thing since sliced bread or any better than Biden, but she can uh, have a, a debate with Trump and, and seem coherent in, in the debate. Um, so I think that both sides are going to come out this time, and, and that's important. As for your question, does does Trump have to win this debate? Uh, I would say, yeah, Trump has to at least come out, um, maybe not having 
won the debate, but having uh, at least stayed even, um, he can't lose the debate at all um, and and still uh, have any chance of, of winning in November. But then again, there's always the, we still got two months to go to and anything can happen. And, and, you know, back in 2016, I thought it was a foregone conclusion that Clinton was going to win. And then you have the the laptop issue and Comey coming back, but you know he he sort of ruined that for her. If you go back and actually and oh, yeah. and and remember that that area, that I don't know it was so much that Trump won that is I think Comey screwed it up for for oh, Clinton. Yeah. So um, there's there's always the the possibility of some weird thing like that happening after the debate as well, and and swaying things one way or the other. So. To answer your question, yes, I think he has to do well in the debate. Um, but then again, you never know what's going to happen after that either. Sure. Well, and the other part of it all is in regards to polling, we know Trump under polls. Yes. Right? Yes, he absolutely. Un he un he under polls. A lot of people who vote for Trump don't want to admit publicly that they're going to vote for Trump. And polls weren't that, that good last time around i mean the, the polls had a red wave coming two years ago that never materialized so I, i'm i don't rely on polls as much as i used to in the battleground states harris leads trump in six of the seven states and the one she does in arizona she's tied mr bradley no trump will be trump and that's going to be the way it's going to be and um in regards to this type of debate I foresee Harris being the one on the hot seat. If she underperforms or doesn't perform very well, then it's a disaster. But, but it, to me, Trump will be Trump. He's not going to change. He is who he is. So I'm hoping that Harris goes out and knocks it out of the park and, and does a better job than what Joe Biden did in the first time. <laughs> So if she um, shows up, she'll do a better job. <laughs> yeah, it's a low bar. <laughs> and I hope Mike Pence's fly doesn't show up as well. So, that fun. Uh, Brad, you bring up a good point because uh, one, she hasn't done many public interviews. She has experience debating. We know that because we saw her for a little while in the previous primary uh, four years ago. We know as a prosecuting attorney, she's used to performing in front of people. However, we don't know on a national stage with the presidency at stake how she's going to do. She just hasn't made that many public appearances in regards to sitting in front of a moderator or being grilled by uh, somebody interviewing her or whatever. This is still an unknown commodity when it comes to Harris's performance in this debate. Well, she's sitting in Pittsburgh right now trying to get her ducks in order and be, be ready, be coached and... Um I hope it goes well. Well, that's where Ferretti and I sat for years, and look how we turned out. <laughs> Going to win it. Mr. Carl. There you go. Well, first of all, I absolutely agree that, that it, it's a good thing for, for Trump that the mic, you know, is muted. <laughs> muted while the other candidate is, you know, making their presentation. Uh, I think that really uh, helped him in the – Biden debate, and I th it'll, it'll help him in this one. But if objectively you could conclude when it's over that Trump lost the debate, then, it, then I'm stunned. And, and, you know, based on what we have seen of both, both of them on, 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 on the merits of policy and consistency in policy. And so uh, I'll be stunned if uh, – Trump loses the debate, and and but if he does, I I, I think it it'll certainly hurt his his prospects for election. The Harris camp, of course, wants the mics unmuted, and for however many years of presidential debates that we've had, sixty, eighty, whatever it's been that you've been able to watch a, a presidential debate on on TV or hear it on a radio, they never had to worry about miking. Uh, mutes because uh, muting mics because people just with decorum knew that right. the other person was talking. You know, you wait for a while to interrupt, or if it's their turn to do their two minute response, you just waited for your turn to respond, and then Trump was the rule breaker. So then we had to have muted mics, but now it would work to the Democrats' advantage to unmute the mics. Yeah, sure. I agree. And now Trump doesn't want the mic. First, Trump wanted the the mics live. 
years ago, and then he didn't want the mics live. Right. So it, it's kind of funny. How that, that just shows how uh, uh, insightful and you know. But uh, but Mike, but, but, while his his base loves it when he insults Harris, calls names, and takes shots, the fact of the matter is, independent voters don't. But when Trump sticks to talking about policy, he does well. Yes. When he gets into the personal attacks and the childish stuff, yes. it turns off those who might vote in either direction. I actually agree with that, and that's why the muted mic deal is a good thing for him. Well, but but he can't do that. Trump too. is Trump. He, yeah, well, and uh, he, he can't control himself. I agree. No, I mean, But moderators are going to determine the narrative. So if, if the moderators don't stick to policy issues, that could be bad for Trump. And if, the, if it's about social issues, issues and, or personality issues and so on and so forth, and, and they don't stick to policy, that could be disastrous for Trump because then you're not talking about policy. Right. And you're not showing the differences between the two of them in policies. You're showing personalities. And, and that would be disastrous for, for Trump. So you, you have to hope, if, if you're a Trump supporter, that the – the moderators stick to uh, policy issues. Well, I, and here's the thing. I think what's going to happen early on in that debate is Harris is going to throw a, a cheap shot and just for the purpose of getting Trump to do his thing. You understand? And you can, you can mute a microphone, but you can't mute the camera. His he does not have a poker face, and he is <laughs> gonna just you're gonna see him reacting, and and you know it doesn't matter if he's not on not on mic, uh, you know they're generally fairly close enough that even if he starts talking, you're gonna be able to hear something in the background. So I think that you know uh, where Trump lost in 2020 was you know his debate performance where he kept on interrupting Biden. It does help that he's gonna be muted, but it's not gonna help him 100 percent of the way. But I do agree with you, Brad. Brad, that the last uh, the, that the debate is very vital for Kamala Harris because she has had issues with, you know, not being forthright, not being, you know, out front and, and dealing with the issues. Rather, you know, just kind of running this high energy campaign. If she flubs policy issues in this debate, it's it it spikes all of her mo momentum. All right. Good job with issue number two. We move on to issue number three, Delegate Michael Height. All right. I'm going to move back to the state and uh, an issue we talked about a little bit earlier. And um, Justice, uh, Governor Justice has indicated that he will call a special session um, later this month. And um, if he does, my question to the panel is, should the legislature cut taxes more than the automatic triggers like Ju governor justice is suggesting the triggers have said it's going to be four percent automatically governor justice wants to cut it another five percent should the legislature do that all right and i don't want a yes or no answer here i want your answer explained as to why you believe the position that you do believe let's start with you michael carl who has more knowledge of the tax system in this state than anybody else at the table well th thank you for the compliment uh I, I say no, they should not go along with it. They, the, his call for this extra tax cut is just a political stunt. As it's, it's, it's so clear that that's all it is. And they now have the evidence that the first two months of the current year, the revenues have not burst above the estimates. And, and, and so, you know, that, that alone is reason to, to slow down. Uh, he, he uh, justice called for a half a billion dollar tax increase, his first state of the state address. You know, and he's trying to offset that, and nobody's talked about it except me. Uh, you know, since, since that happened, and 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 uh, uh, he he also fought the constitutional amendment that would have enabled a better method of 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 tax reduction, uh, uh, personal property tax reduction, and income tax reduction. Uh, but but they have you know. The, le the legislature and he, you know, he signed the bills, uh, have now enabled a, this this uh, phase-in system to work, 
and and uh, so uh, but the answer is no he should uh, they should not go along with this extra increase do you like the triggering mechanism that's in place mike well i i would have preferred what would have happened if the amendment hadn't been uh you know not adopted but uh i i, th- I think I, I prefer that to to justice is just calling for these you know separate uh separate actions uh i think it works well yeah mr bradley Knoll. i'm confounded by this situation i believe that if any time that you can put money back into people's pockets you should try to do it however in this situation you know i'm, I'm not in the legislature I, and at, at this point i would default to michael height for this because he's in the legislature and, and therefore i would say um, probably not because of the triggers. I think they put the triggers in place for that reason, and, and you should not bounce back and forth. And and this this is going to be a problem with the future as well. If you have a good year, do we take money out? I, you put triggers in place for that reason. So I, I'll default to Michael Hayden. I'm confounded on this issue. I have no yes, no. I don't know, Mr. Valente. Uh, I am firmly against this, and and which is you know rare for a libertarian to think of. of I'm shocked. Know, t- tax <laughs> tax reduction. I mean, we we talked with Eric Householder this morning, and he talked about you know the revenue is not quite hitting the targets or right around the targets. Um, this does reek of a political move yeah. to solidify Justice's chances in the Senate race, which I don't think he should be worried about, but. Um, a more of a conviction of some sort rather than, than his chances in the Senate race. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't like this at all because I think it's a waste of money dragging you all back down to, to Charleston. And, um, you know, I think that if you're at this point kind of treading water as far as the revenues go, probably not the best thing to just slap on another 5% decrease in revenues. Are you in favor of the 4% the trigger is going to affect? Yeah. All right. Now you said it would be a waste of money. What did you mean by a waste of money? Dragging these guys down to Charleston, oh, RDM and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if you meant the money. tax, additional tax cut is a waste of money or if you meant something else by that. Yeah. No, just the effect of having a special session is, is expensive. Mr. Ferretti. Uh, Mike Hyde, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised this is even a, a matter of debate. I mean, this is a governor who has exhibited great skill in handling financial matters and budgeting and things <laughs> like that. Why, why wouldn't the legislature follow his lead on this tax cut? Uh, but seriously, uh, I, I don't think we should follow his lead. Uh, I think the triggering mechanism was done uh, for a reason. I'm sure it was well thought out as to when it's appropriate to, to cut taxes. And I think you stick to the plan. Uh, and you got to read the room. Look, we're, we're, we just got a jobs report that was uh, uh, a little less than uh, anticipated, 142,000 new jobs created in August, downward revisions of some of the recent summer tallies that were done. Uh, you know, this is a market nationwide that's cooling. Uh, it's what the Fed wanted with the rise in interest rates, and, and uh, here we are. So uh, we're going to go through a little rough patch here, and I think we know historically West Virginia suffers more than most states when there's a downturn in the national economy. So I think it pays to be prudent, follow the plan, don't follow the path of the governor. I think when you get into the discussion of tax cuts, you start to really have to go deeper into what is the role of government because the government has a budget it has to follow. You can't print money in a state. You have to balance your budget. So if you're going to have a tax cut, you can't get away with a tax cut like the federal politicians do, where, oh, yeah, let's pass a tax cut, and we didn't cut any spending, so therefore we just start printing more money to cover for the tax cut, right? At the state level, you're going to pass a tax cut. you got to put some spending cuts in unless you're getting enough revenue growth that you can justify the tax cut. And with that growth... Getting back to like a normal, as Eric said, 3% growth in the state on an annual basis. You pass tax cuts. There's no more federal money flowing in from COVID or whatever that you can gloss it over with. So you start to get into the basics of what is the role of state government. Mike, Republicans are so firmly entrenched in West Virginia running government right now. 
with super majorities in the House and the Senate, Republican governor, and it appears that that's going to continue. Has there been a comprehensive overall committee look at what the role of West Virginia state government is right now, that things are fisc- fairly fiscally sound, and Republicans have so much control? Well, I think I think the, the policy that the Republicans have set forth um, is that you need to improve the economy within West Virginia. And if you improve the economy within West Virginia um, through job growth, uh, economic development, that revenues will follow. And that as those revenues increase, um, then you can you can either have tax reduction or you can you can grow uh, what we talked about earlier with uh, pay for let's say teachers or 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 state employees who many feel are underpaid right now. So you need to be able to get both of those right. Um, and I think many Republicans want to do tax cuts. They want to do it in a responsible way, and that's why we put the triggers in place. But we also want to get uh, the the pay right, and we want to get make sure that the state employees are are at least in in, in uh, throughout the state are are getting the right pay, and that that may be locality pay that we talked about earlier as well. And if you're going to do those things, you need money to do it as well. So you can't you can't cut all the revenue and, and give it back to the people um, and raise uh, pay at the same time. There has to be a balance there. And if, if the economic development ha- is doing what it's supposed to do, the revenue is going to keep increasing. But you can't get over your skis. You can't get ahead of it. You can't get the, the cart in front of the horse. You have to allow the time for those economic development uh, uh, businesses to pan out and to increase the revenue. And then you can start doing some of the other things. So I, I think you have to reject this. Um, many say political stunt um, and and stick to the triggers. And hopefully you, you continue to raise revenues and you still see those surpluses uh, on down the road. And then you can responsibly decide how to use those surpluses and whether or not you need to grow government in certain areas, cut government in certain areas, um, and and do it in a responsible way. All right. This first issue, Mr. Bradley Knoll. My favorite subject, driving the gauntlet. What I call the gauntlet is Route 9 West. To me, it is obvious that the Route 9 West bypass would never be built. Are there other options along with the suggested enhancements that was recently introduced back in the summer? What can we do to alleviate the problems on Route 9 West? Describe a typical commute on Route 9 West for us, Brad. Um, Well, for me to just get to the station, and I, I should have measured it, but it took me almost an hour. Oh, my. So, I, I mean, something's got to be done. And, and I'm not so sure. We, we I, I, I'm, I know that they're going to add some roundabouts. And when I came to this roundabout out the end of the road, that was the first time I was on it. And I was just dumbfounded. Didn't even know that that was put in. Eagle School Road. Yeah, right. Eagle School <laughs> I thought, wow. And that's just a small one. Uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for this. And I, I just wish that. Somebody and, and the DOH, when they looked at it, uh, I, this has been looked at for 40 years. I was a teenager when this was discussed, and and, and nothing's nothing's been done. I, I I think we maybe should look at this like we do some of the Pennsylvania roads. When you go to Pennsylvania, they have a lot of small side connector roads. So maybe in this county, maybe we should start thinking about adding some small roads. So that's just my opinion. All right. And, uh, Brad, if you had no traffic, how long would it take you to get from your house to here? To here? Yeah. Probably. Um, 20 minutes? 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. That's, that took about an hour. I, I would say we're, I, I don't know, but I probably live about 17 to 18, 20 miles away. It's, mm-hmm. it's not more than 20 miles. I'm sure of that. Okay. 
All right. Uh, well, Mike, you're the guy in the legislature, and you know all about the Route 9 problems. Take a shot at it. Uh, and, and, you know, a good portion of Route 9 um, west of I-81 is in my district. And uh, when I got elected the, the first time, um, within the first two weeks, I went down to uh, the Department of Highways and to Jimmy Riston's office, Secretary Riston, and, and brought this, this exact subject up and said you know we have we have ignored this for way too long um uh, there were some other delegates in the room with me as well and i uh, said you know something needs to happen here you know we're working on corridor h that gets one fifth of the traffic that that route nine gets um and we're we're talking about the the king cole highway down in the southern part of the state which is needed but you know for one fifth of the number of of, uh, of citizens. So why aren't we taking care of this? His answer to me was, "Well, if if you give me two billion dollars, I'll start tomorrow." And I, I my attitude was, you know, that's not an answer. That's just a cop out. Um, this is just your way of saying, "Get out of my office." I have no intention of doing anything about this. Um, after that, uh, with last session, um, Secretary Riston came to me and says, I have a gift for you. And I was like, well, this ought to be good. He says, we're going to do Route 9. And I was like, hallelujah, you're going to do the bypass. He says, no, not quite the bypass. We're going to do some enhancements. And I was like, well, don't tease me. What, what are we talking about here? And uh, he says, well, it's all going to be announced this summer. He says, you know, the governor's going to come up. Uh, the, the Senate president's going to come up. They we're going to announce all this stuff. So I, I go to the announcement. County commissioners, a bunch of people show up. It was at the DMV along Route 9, and, and that was their plan. We're going to do 15 roundabouts and enhanced uh, route nine, a little widening here and there, turn lanes in, 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 uh, Hedgesville. And this is, this is our plan. I was furious. This is just more kicking the can down the road for one of the largest growing counties in West Virginia. And the largest, the, growing, yeah. the largest growing county in West Virginia and not and one of the largest growing areas in West Virginia out Route 9 it is just going to get worse as developments go further out west. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And, and Brad, you're right. They have had this on the books for 40 years. You can go on the West Virginia Department of Highways right now and see the plans and see how long they've been there. It is, and, and there's six or seven different routes that they've already picked out and they've done studies on. Why they just don't go ahead and do the, the, the bypass, I have no idea. This is short-sightedness um, because it's only going to get worse and it's only going to grow more. And, and if you wait, it's only going to cost more because uh, the routes are going to get bought up and developed and, and you would have to tear houses down to do it. So uh, I am extremely disappointed that this is the route that the uh, Department of Highways has chosen to take. And I am still a proponent of a bypass around Hedgesville. Um, I just don't know if it's ever going to happen. Mike, uh, you're going to be surprised at this, but Ken Matson has made a snarky comment. I know this is going to surprise you. <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine. Ken, I just can't imagine. Ken says, guess having people in leadership didn't work out. Um, I, well, he, I'm sure he wasn't talking about me because I'm not in leadership. So uh, I know I knew who he was referring to, and yeah. Uh, okay, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Carl. Well, I certainly uh, support... Uh, improvements and getting that straightened out but, and, but but i'm very cynical about why it hasn't happened and and there's got to be you know people who have interest in one you know arrangement commercial interest or or another and and they're fighting and and you know behind the scenes uh you know they're they just can't come to a reasonable compromise 
and and it's it's it, it, it is disgusting that it hadn't been fixed and it's taken this long because the problem you know is getting worse for sure and I, 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 that's, I, I can't really add anything other than just uh, the, the cynicism about why it hadn't happened mr. Valente so our roads are I you know it's, it's like a ca- cardiovascular system of, of our communities you know and when there is a clog you start seeing death in those communities, the, you know, cell damage, whatever. You're you starting to make me is, feel bad for having <laughs> cheesecake last week. <laughs> Never feel bad about having cheesecake. Uh, the what's going to start happening is you're going to see less development on the west side because people aren't going to want to move there. You're not going to be able to sell houses out there because people don't want to sit in traffic for their entire lives. Um, that won't happen. <laughs> and. And the the way that the the county commission, I know we've got lobbyists going down to Charleston on behalf of the county commission, and and you know our representatives, we definitely need to full court press because the state is right is is depending on our income. It, that that's the only that's the truth. The state depends on the Eastern Panhandle's income, and the less that they funnel back here to get this road done. And the, the, the half measures that they're doing right now uh, aren't going to address the issue. Nobody knows how to drive in a roundabout around here. Um, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see damage to the community because people are just not going to want to deal with sitting in traffic for, for their entire lives. It's getting bad on, on Route 11 heading towards the, the, the highway now. Every afternoon, it's the same same issue. North We've or got, south, you talking about? Uh, going north to, towards uh, I eighty one from from Spring Mills. It's getting bad because we have got several massive communities that have moved in there. Mine is one of them, and you know, it, there's it's a one lane road, and there really isn't a whole lot of room to make more lanes there. So, you know, planning has to to really take take shape and. We really need our, our, you know, our county commission, our legislators to really push this narrative that you deny the Eastern Panhandle the ability to address our roads. We're not going to be able to give you those nice, rosy financial numbers that you're depending on. Mr. Ferretti. Well, I'll give you a different perspective here in terms of of, uh, living in the Panhandle. I I lived there, of course, for 34 years, moved there in 19... uh, 91 and and at the time Berkeley County had 58,000 in population now we we've more than lapped that uh, in terms of number of people living in the county and, and our road system just hasn't kept up it took 30 years to build the Raleigh Street extension and that's what is that even a mile it took 30 years to get that road in place uh, and so I, I'm not bullish on on the ability of the state to, to build something like a massive project of route 9 west and we're going to suffer for it. I'm stunned when I come back to the panhandle to work uh, and, and, you know, you, you're not there every day. I'm just stunned at the amount of traffic and the delays that people suffer getting from point A to point B. The, the loss of productivity, the, the lost time sitting behind your windshield it, it has to be immense. And uh, it, it's just striking to me when you're not there every day to see what's developing in Berkeley County. And it's not good. Could we, you know, if we're not going to improve the roads, could we at least figure out the timing on the traffic lights? Oh, my goodness. I mean, 5 a.m., I'm, I'm sitting on Edwin Miller Boulevard with nobody around me at a red light? I mean, do I need a red light in that situation at 5 a.m.? Really? Can we figure this part out? If we can't do the roads, it's a lot less expensive to maybe figure out the traffic lights. On, on a positive note, it, it looks like there's a good chance that, that we elect a governor – from the eastern panhandle coming up in november there's a good chance that happens i would if if you want to see this happen um i would let him know that this is something that his administration needs to focus on um you know you want to be our next governor you come from the panhandle you know our pains um we want you to represent us um and and not be ignored by the rest of the state make this happen that would be patrick morrissey to whom you are referring 
86, I moved to Northern Virginia, lived in Fairfax County for two years. 88 to 92, lived in Montgomery County for four years. So I've experienced with I-66, the Beltway, 395, 95. And anybody who's ever tried to commute I-95 Springfield understands mm-hmm. what not moving is actually like. Uh, 270, Ugh. all the all the major artery clogs around the Washington, D.C. area, I have spent a lot of time idling exhaust fumes uh, in. And a lot of people fled that area and came out here. And you want growth, but you don't have the road expansion. This is what you get. Yes. Right? Yeah. All right, uh, issue number five, that would be Michael Carl, the anchor leg. It's a question. Uh, do you agree that Israel is entitled to absolute U.S. support of its military effort against Hamas and not to be confused about calls for ceasefires? Good question. We haven't discussed this one too much, even though that's been such an issue. On to the world stage. Brad, no. Uh, yes, I completely ag- agree that we should be giving Israel, the, the Israel military, all the might, all the backing, all the possible things that they could possibly need to eliminate Hamas. To me, Hamas, if you do not want to have problems and, and um, have a future that is, is not peaceful and you attack someone else, if you're the aggressor in any nation, you deserve to be annihilated as far as I'm concerned. Now, that's, I know that's not a democratic response, but that's Brad Null response. I do not claim to be the voice of the Democrats. I'm just, anything I say on this show is my opinion. So there's a disclaimer. I think Mike Carl is going to make you an honorary Republican today, Brad. <laughs> uh, or, or at least that. a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> How about a dino? dino right? <laughs> Joe, Joe Ferretti. Well, I, I, I agree with the premise. Mike, Carl, that, uh, yeah, we have to continue to support Israel militarily and, and, and in other ways. Uh, they were attacked. It wasn't their fault. Uh, they didn't invite it. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they need to uh, root out that problem. Now, the, the, the issue, though, there's a couple thorny little issues here. Number one, uh, we can say, yeah, we're going after Hamas. In, in many respects, we're going after an ideology. And it's hard to kill an ideology as we learned when we tried to root out ISIS and kill them. Uh, They just keep coming back because it's an ideology, and you can't stamp that out. You can kill people, but it's really tough to to deal trains of thought. Uh, So that's one problem Israel's going to have. The other problem is the collateral damage. And I I think we have to understand that many on on the left who object to these military actions by Israel, it's because of the innocent Palestinians who are dying and starving and being rooted out of their homes and, and having to flee the uh, the carnage and the damage. It's I, I don't think it's support for Hamas so much. Now, yeah, there's some out there that are idiots who, who support Hamas, but overall, there has to be concern about the collateral damage here. And and, and I'm you know to what extent Israel is trying to be careful about that is always going to be a matter of debate. It's it's going to be a messy fog of war type thing but uh i I think that you know we have to be cognizant that there are some thorny issues here that are that are difficult and inherent in a middle east conflict as israel steps forward and i would add by the way that if israel as a country has a right to self-determination and defense uh i would have a hard time distinguishing that from ukraine which i think also has a right to uh defense and self-determination i agree with that joe mr height Yeah, I think um, we've we've always supported Israel um, militarily, um, so we need to continue to do that and and not uh, second guess and dictate to them how they fight their fight. Either we're supporting them or we're not, you know. And you know, Joe, you bring up collateral damage, and um, I, you know, I look back through history, and I can't remember a war where there wasn't collateral damage, where there weren't innocent civilians uh killed or 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 moved out of their home if you look at the the destruction and the bombing in germany and in the uk and in france um whole cities were annihilated and people had to pick up whatever they had left and and move this is what happens when there are wars 
this is what's happening in Gaza. You know, we can talk about the innocent Palestinians, but those innocent Palestinians backed Hamas in Gaza. And when you back a group like Hamas and they bring war to their citizens, this is what happens. So I, I have a hard time feeling bad for the innocent Palestinians. Our job as the U.S. is to defend Israel and back them, and that's what we should be doing and, and not second-guessing them. Mr. Valente cracked a very wry smile during your response. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we could probably do two, two hours just on what led to Hamas in, in Palestine and, and really the, how the Israeli government really handheld Hamas into power in, in uh, Gaza back uh, when they took over. Um, the, the problem here is to to what extent do you want to support what Israel is doing? Uh, if you are going to say, Katie, you know, bar the doors and let's let's give them everything. Collateral damage is not just the innocent civilians being harmed there. The collateral damage also comes to our reputation if there if it becomes a situation where people are innocent people are being harmed. Um, you know. They, Joe is right that you can't – it's hard to fight an ideology. And when you are fighting an ideology like what is going on with Hamas or Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, the indiscriminate killing feeds the fire. It feeds what's going on there. And – we need to, as a nation, if we want to be a nation that supports, you know, uh, supports a world that we would like to see, there do need to be some limits. There do need to be some red lines that if Israel decides to, you know, uh, carpet bomb Gaza, carpet bomb uh, uh, Beirut, or the you know uh, southern Lebanon, there there have to be some red lines about where we support. I'm fully in support of you know if Iran is sending missiles and drones and like they did back in in June, you know, sending wave after wave trying to to hit Israel, us defending Israel. I have no problem with that, but. There are no some problem with attacking that or accepting no, no, I, it, it with that, us, that they're doing it. No, I have no problem with us defending Israel in that situation. OK, yeah. It sounds, no, it sounds no, like you're got, saying it's OK to, for, the, for yeah. Iran to do that. You almost got well, Mike out I of mean, his chair. I look, it, it's it's a war. Uh, Iran has the does have the the right to do it. I do think that they have some some grievances with Israel. Whether they're valid or not is is up for debate, and I, whether what they are doing is more performative than actual warfare, um, uh, I would also say look at look at Russia when it comes to what happened on October seventh. Right, that uh, the, there's lots of things there that I think Russia was responsible for. Agreed. Um, but yeah, it, there there has to be a a limit to where we support. There has to be a red line, or we become no better. Got to wrap it up, David? No better than, than what we're trying to fight. Final 30 seconds of thought on this one, Michael. The only difference between Hamas and uh, Iran is that they don't have swastikas. It's an absolute response on behalf of Israel that we need and not anything that's constrained by these issues that have been brought up. All right.